And uh, if we can pull it together, you know, we got out of town for a fourth. But we're one big happy family. All right, we're going to sing. We're going to start off this morning with Rejoice. start off with the scripture here in Psalm 122. It says, I rejoiced with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing in your gates, Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built like a city that is closely compacted together. That is where the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, to praise the name of the Lord, according to the statute given to Israel. And I just wanted to welcome everybody as we come together to be compact as a unit today. And just have a great time. Give worship to the Lord and have a great time today. I'm going to pray and then we'll continue the service. Lord, thank you for uh, the worship team here, Lord, and just how they're getting us going this morning, Lord. Help us to get going in the crowd and just to worship you as we uh, continue today, Lord. Help the lesson to hit our hearts and to impact us for uh, the rest of the week and for the rest of the month, Lord. Uh, just to truly be connected with you today. And I pray this all in your name. Amen. Amen, 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 amen. Let's talk about a place we want to go. Let's tell you about a place we want to go. Let's talk about a place we want to go. Let's talk about a place we want to go. Let's talk about a place we want to go. Let's talk about a place we want to go. Let's talk about a place we want to go. Let's talk about a place we want to go. Let's talk about a place we want to go. Let's talk about a place we want to go. Let's talk about a place we want to go. Let's talk about a place we want to go. Let's talk about a place we want to go. Let's talk about a place we want to go. Let's talk about a place we want to go. Let's talk about a place we want to go. Let's talk about a place we want to go. Let's talk about a place we want to go. Let's talk about a place
church. Here we go. Come on. Come on and praise the Lord with me. Come on and praise the Lord with me. Everybody sing it. Praise the Lord with me. Oh yeah, yeah. Praise the Lord with me. Sing hallelujah church. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Everybody sing it. Hallelujah. Everybody sing one more time. Say next song we're going to sing is Lord I Thank You. It's 600. I know we have a lot of them. This is the Father If Not For Your Mercy one. Come on, brother. We'll start off with snapping. <laughs> Father, if not for your mercy, I'd be nothing. I know that Lost forever, Lord, I thank you for your mercy. Oh, praise your holy name. Kindness, Father, if not for your kindness, I'd be nothing. I know that I'll be lost forever, Lord, I thank you for your kindness. Oh, praise your holy name. Goodness, Father, if not for your goodness, I'd be nothing. Lost forever, Lord, I thank you for your patience. 
morning church you may be seated we're going to continue to worship God as we approach the foot of the cross and the song that uh, we're going to sing together is God is so good Um, sometimes you hear it in passing but I want to invite you to take three seconds to connect to what that means for you Um, what has God been for you and not just in the challenging spaces but when you're on the mountaintop think of what that experience with God is like and take that into your worship. Amen. We're going to sing God is so good. Church. God. God is so good. God Sing that again. God is so good. 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 My God is good. He cares for me. 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 Oh, he's so good. God answers prayer. God answers prayer. God answers prayer. God answers prayer. Answers pray. He's so good. And I love him so. 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 God is so good. 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 My God is so good. He's so good to me. Amen, church. Good morning, church. How are you guys? I'm Michael Milton, and I have the the honor to share with you my thoughts on communion. Um, I love the summer, guys, um, especially July, because we get to celebrate so many things in our family. Uh, We get to celebrate, you know, my daughter's birthday. We get to celebrate, you know, my mother-in-law's birthday. Uh, We get to celebrate my birthday this, this month as well. Uh, but most importantly, um, you know, uh, that, that I love to celebrate and I appreciate um, is we, we are able to celebrate our anniversary. Uh, me and my wife has been married. We have been married for 11 years yesterday. 
So it's amazing there as well. So, um, and, and all of you guys can, you, you can talk to my wife and ask her too. I, I love to just kind of sit on my phone and look at pictures. If you haven't done that before, you should. Just to kind of remember and just to kind of, you know, kind of go through those certain uh, moments in your life and everything too. So I wanted to share with you guys a little bit about the 11 years we've had together as a, a married couple there. So um, this, is a, this is just a, a few screenshots that I took for, for every year. Some years I have a little more pictures, but throughout this, this picture, it shows a few things that we did. You know, with, with us first meeting, um, our marriage, um, you know, when my wife graduated from pharmacy school and our buying our first home, uh, the birth of our daughter, uh, we had a few trips in between there with friends and family and everything as well. Then the birth of my son as well, Eli, we, we call him 696. I'll tell you guys after why. Uh, some of you guys know already, but uh, we, we call them 696. And then just recently opening the business together. You know, these, these are things that I cherish, and, and I, I like to reflect and just to think about that. You know, the good times that we had together, the bad times that we had together, the moments we had to learn uh, different things the hard way or the good way. You know, these are things that I love to reflect. And as I was preparing the uh, communion this morning, I just was really thinking about that. That's the same way we should think about the relationship we have with Jesus. The the sacrifice that he gave us um, on the cross for us to be forgiven for our sins. You know, we need to take the time to reflect on that, to understand the importance, to build our relationship closer to him uh, by doing that as well. So I wanted to share with you guys a scripture in uh, Luke 22 uh, that kind of just talks about that and, and why it's important. So, Um, It's it's Luke 22, uh, verse 17 through 20. It says, after taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took the bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is a new covenant of my blood, which is poured out for you. I get, I get a little emotional with this, but um, this is important to remember, you know, just where he said, uh, in remembrance of me. It's important for us to just remember and reflect, you know, the ultimate sacrifice that he, he has done for us, um, for us to have a relationship with God, for us to be able to be forgiven for our sins. Um, so, just come with me in prayer to just uh, get our hearts and our minds ready to just remember the sacrifice and also to just reflect our lives just to make sure that as we remember and as we go through our lives, we reflect and, and just make sure that our heart is ready um, to just go about our days and just remembering what God has done for us. All right, let's pray. Uh, dear Father in heaven, uh, we just give you thanks today just, just for the opportunity to pray to you. Um, just for the opportunity to be forgiven for our sins. I pray, dear God, that we take this, uh, this uh, cup of, of juice and, and the bread, dear God, just in remembrance of the ultimate sacrifice you gave uh, for your only son, uh, for us to be able to be in your presence, uh, for us to have a relationship with you. Um, I thank you for those moments. I thank you for allowing us to do that. I just pray this all in your son Jesus' name. Amen.
Good morning, church. Uh, this is the uh, partner service where we'll take up a, a collection for our offering to God, and uh, I'm going to say a prayer for that right now. Uh, God, uh, I am so grateful for all the ways that you have, uh, that you've blessed me. Um, you know, I, I believe we all feel the same, God, and that we're, we're just so grateful. Uh, God, I pray that we will honor you and love you with all of our heart, uh, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and, uh, you know, even with our finances, God, I pray that uh, that you bless this offering, that you will search us out, God, and if there's any any part of us that is, um, you know, just holding back from you in any way, God, that you will reveal that in us, even as we uh, meditate on this uh, in this moment, uh, that we'll see how we can um, how we can give to you, uh, give back to you out of the abundance that you've given us. I love you, Jesus' name, pray, Amen. Uh, if you'd like to give contribution, you can go to our website at DetroitChurch.org and go to the uh, giving site, or you can uh, give it the black contribution box at the back during the fellowship break. At this time, we're going to have a short video. And you can get one of these uh, uh, Walk for Hope flyers at, at the back, and that's to help support the uh, Women's Walkathon. Uh, so, you know, if you're visiting here for the first time, I want to let you know that, you know, the Detroit Church is a church that's really devoted to God's Word, uh, to the fellowship, to building each other up, and to walking like disciples. The other thing we're passionate about is softball. And uh, every year, we have an annual softball league, and, uh, you know, we've... Uh, we've People kind of risk life and limb, you know, they put it all on the line, they put their heart out there to win this bad boy right here. And yes, thank you, yes. I'm very proud of it. Long storied history, and uh, so, you know, there's six teams, and only four teams make the playoffs, and uh, this year, you know, there was an epic storyline, and I won't... uh, uh, you know, talk too much about it, but I got to tell you a little bit about this storyline, okay? You had uh, the, the, the fourth place Ninja Turtles playing the, yes, the amazing team, two-time champions, playing the first place Sugar Gliders. Now, the Sugar Gliders do have a reputation of choking in the playoffs, but there was an epic match. It went back and forth, but the sh- Sugar Gliders won that match. Yes, that's right. Yes, thank you. And then in the other one, uh, you had the third. You, you had the third. Uh, the third place uh, Rhinos. Uh, they were placed in the second place Hidden Dragons. And I got to tell you, Hidden Dragons were last year's champion. You know what I'm saying? And so, well, they looked like champions. Of course, they won eight six. And then it got down to the first place Sugar Gliders against the Hidden Dragons. And uh, we're excited to say that the new champions for 2022 are the Sugar Gliders. We're going to ask Mitch Perez, the coach of the team, can we have all members of the Sugar Gliders stand on up? If you're part of that championship team, stand on up so we can recognize you. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. And we have a tradition in the Detroit church. You're not allowed to touch the trophy unless you've won the championship. You can observe it, but you can't touch it. If you're not a uh, softball player, you can touch it. Actually, you can all touch it. It doesn't, uh, nothing happens. There's nothing mystical about it. Uh, We, uh, every 
year we, uh, we, set, we put out a uh, Most Valuable Player Award. Yes, that's right. This is to the, uh, the person that is the best player. And uh, this year, excited to say, uh, the, uh, the nominees. We always have three nominees, and we, we, uh, we get the coaches to, to nominate people, and then they, they put a first-place vote and a second-place vote, and we tally the points, and we see who won. So the nominees uh, uh, for MVP, you have to clap after I say each name. It sounds, you know, that's how it goes. The nominees for MVP are Mitch Perez. Yeah, yeah, the sugar gliders. Mike Polk, uh, Hidden Dragons. Yeah, that's right. Mike Michaud. That's right. And the winner is... Oh, yeah, I just see this. The winner for MVP is... Mitch Perez. We also have uh, the most inspiring player, uh, which goes to the top female player. The top female player, that's right. So uh, the nominees for top female player or most inspirational player are Michaela Brent, that's right. Morgan Zakowitz, and, uh, and Chelsea Polk. The winner. This is uh, this is so exciting. I can't take it. All right, here we go. Let's see this here? Yes, that's right. The winner is the 2022 top female player is Chelsea Paul. Oh, come on up. Your champions here. Let's have one final hand. You guys can grab a seat. All right. <laughs> One last thing. I'd like to close a very inspiring announcement. About a, a year and a half ago, we had a brother named uh, Josh Lutz, uh, who, along with his wife, Michelle, uh, it's a young couple that were going to kind of replant the church in uh, Springfield and uh, Illinois. And uh, they asked for people to come on up to help serve, to devote a time, six months, a year of their life, so they could help build up the kingdom. Uh, we had one sister answer that call, uh, Janet Brown. And he, yes, in the last six months, she's been serving there in the church. And uh, Josh wrote me a letter. He said, Dear Kings, Michelle and I wanted to reach out and just say that we're grateful. These past six months with Janet being in Springfield. Yesterday during service, we thanked her for her time in Springfield and her sacrifice. She was a blessing to us all. She, uh, and so they announced that yesterday was her last Sunday with us. After the Lutzes visited the Detroit Church of Christ last summer, Janet was moved by the Spirit to commit six months of her life to serve and give the Springfield Church. While she was here, she's been an encouraging and hospitable and inspiring example of discipleship to Jesus. On top of her service to church, she became a regular volunteer at the Washington Street Mission, where, she, uh, where we meet for church on Sundays. Her love for the community was evident. She'll be dearly missed by those she served. We hope that Janet will be back to visit us. We miss her already. Janet has moved back here. We just want to hold her up for her time. If you can stand up, sister, just so we can. Uh, thank you so much for your service to the saints. I appreciate you. At this time, we're going to have a brief fellowship break. Let's stand on up, and we'll come back in about three minutes. And I do encourage everyone to, you know, kind of move closer to the inside. A lot of people out of town. Our next song will be Waiting the Water. All right. Here we go. We.
everybody. First thing before Kevin and Nick leave the stage, just wanted to point out, we did text this morning and coordinate. Uh, so I just want to make sure all the guys know that's okay to do. You can coordinate, that's fine. There does become a point where it's weird, but I don't think we've reached it yet. I, I'm mostly just trying to be proactive because I know some of you are feeling critical about the matching. Uh, today, uh, you can open up your Bible to Psalm... 42. We, uh, first of all, wanted to, I want to say, this wasn't mentioned yet, but uh, the Ann Arbor Church, we're going to be, after this week, starting next week, we're going to be meeting back in Ann Arbor. Uh, it's great to be together. It's beautiful to be together, and it needs to happen every year, but we also need to be in Ann Arbor. Uh, that's our community. That's where we can reach people the most and participate in that part of the mission, so I just want to make sure that you knew that. Um, and that you weren't worried because none of us were coming to church anymore. Uh, we are going to church, we're just going somewhere on the other side of town. Uh, we are starting a new series, the Detroit Church, on soul. Soul. You know, and, and this, this word is 
hard to define. You know, it's a word that you intuitively know what it means because you're a part of a culture where we talk about the soul a lot. But if I were to ask you, how do you define the word soul? I, I would confidently say you would struggle to define it. Yeah. Uh, there's a, in um, Hebrews chapter 4, there's a verse where it says that the word of God divides soul and spirit. Yeah. And we study that when we study the word of God with people. And, and we'll often, if this ever happens to you, if anyone asks, why, like, what's the difference? You'll be like, ah, I don't know. I think the point is, is that we don't know the difference, right? Like, it's close. That's the whole point, is that God's word can get anywhere in your heart. And so, this word soul, I, I did a word study at the beginning of the week when I realized we were doing this, and, and I learned so many cool things I don't have time to share with you. The reason I told you I learned cool things is so you could go back and learn those cool things for yourself. Right? The, the point is, is that the word soul is not a simple word. And to, to our knowledge, right, the way we think about it is, well, let me ask this question first, because obviously I got my slides in the wrong order. But let me start with this. The, the one question I'm asking you today to take away from, and if you walk away and someone's like, hey, I missed the sermon, what did he talk about? It's, we were trying to answer the question, what does your soul want? What does your soul want? And no, intuitively, we understand what that means, even if you can't define the word. You know, uh, soul in the English dictionary uh, means this, the principle of life, feeling, thought, and actions in humans, regarded as a distinct entity separate from the body. So this idea that your body is sort of inhabiting your soul, or rather your soul is inhabiting your body. Your body is the vessel and one day your body will die, and your soul will be disconnected from it, and your soul is who you really are, right? That's kind of the, our modern idea. It's actually a little different in the Bible, but I'm only going to tease it because I don't have time. <laughs> in the Bible, the word means a lot more than that, but essentially, what you think about when you think about soul is fine for the purposes of our series. Right. The whole being, who you are, what you're like, everything about you, your body, your mind, your spirit, your, your intellect, your consciousness, right? Your soul, it's who you are deep down. You know, today the title of the sermon is Soul Thirst. Okay. Right. Soul Thirst. Have you ever been really thirsty before? If, if some of you were like, I'm really thirsty right now. That communion juice was not enough, you know. Um... <laughs> You know, on like a fasting day, you eat the communion, you feel kind of guilty, but you also feel like that was delicious. Like, <laughs> I really needed that, you know. Have you ever been thirsty before? You know, I have, I have two children, as you well know, and uh, kids are interesting. So my kids will be so happy, well hydrated, well nourished, playing. And normally when you're thirsty, you think, oh, I'm a little thirsty. Like, I'm going to go get some water. But children, it's just like, it's like, I'm totally fine, and then I, I will literally die if you don't give me water right now. The other day, we were in the car, and my daughter was happy. She's talking to herself, and then she was like, Daddy, I'm so, I'm so, I'm so thirsty. And I'm like, yo, like, you're not in jail. Like, I can, I'll give you water whenever you want. Like, you don't have to come at me like that, you know what I mean? I'm sorry, I'm just so thirsty. And I'm, and her, I'm almost thinking she's feeling like, why don't you like, let me drink whenever I want? And now my kids, they know what to do, right? They can grab a cup and they can get the water. And yet still, it's like, I need water. I'm like, you need to go get water. Like, I, I, I'm not going to spoon feed you your whole, like, you can do it. And they're like, oh yeah, like, I can do that. Like, when you're really thirsty, it's all you think about. Other discomforts sort of fade into the background, don't they? Like, when you're thirsty, pains are momentarily forgotten because this pain is greater. Like, it must be fulfilled. It's not unlike being underwater and needing air. You can be really hungry, but you're not thinking about it when you need air. Yeah. Like, there's a greater need, right? Yeah. Thirst is like that. There's this oft-repeated concept in the Bible of our soul thirsting. Yeah. There is such a thing as being thirsty in your soul. Psalm 42, we'll read the whole thing together. Because really, in many ways, you'll see the word soul here said like six times. 
And this idea of soul thirst is brought out. Psalm 42, starting in verse 1. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food. It's like my daughter when she's thirsty. You know what I mean? Day and night. Men say to me all day long, they mock me, where is your God? I remember these things as I pour out my what? My soul. How I used to go with the multitude, leading the procession to the house of God, with shouts of joy and thanksgiving among the festive throng. He's like, I remember when I did these great things with you. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God. The author is speaking to his soul, almost as if they're a different person. Put your hope in God. I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. My soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mazar, deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day the Lord directs his love at night. His song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. Stick with me, we're almost there. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me saying to me here it is again where is your god why isn't he here why isn't he fixing your problems why are you downcast oh my soul why so disturbed within me put your hope in god for i will yet praise him my savior and my god powerful psalm what's the attitude of the psalmist longing when can i meet with god when can I be with him? Well, of course, God's not far from any of us, but sometimes it feels that way. Why can't I feel close to God? Why is he so hard to grasp? Full of sadness, my tears have been my food night and day. Have you ever cried so much that you felt thirsty afterward? You know what I mean? It's like almost, did you notice who said yes there? None of the guys, even though I know it's true. You know what I mean? Like... They're like, oh, never, that has never happened to me. The girls are like, mm hmm, uh, mm-hmm, yep. Sometimes you just need a good cry, right? If you cried so much that you just feel exhausted, like, my, <laughs> there it is again. It's great. Uh, why so disturbed within me? The Hebrew word for disturbed means to rage, yeah. to growl, to moan, to, to be loud, to be troubled. Why are you, why is your soul confused? Why is it angry? Why are you disturbed, soul? There's a loneliness. Why have you forgotten me? People are telling me, where is your God? And I have no answer for them because I'm asking the same question. Why isn't God showing up in pain? My bones suffer mortal agony. What is the psalmist's solution to these feelings? Go to God. There are three times. Just put your hope in God. He actually only says put your hope once. And then he says, I remember. When I used to do these things, I remember what it was like. I remember, and that brings me hope, right? Put your hope in God. Stake your thirst with God. Jesus promises many things to us. The Bible promises many things. Probably, and perhaps the most elusive for Christians. And the most difficult to grasp in a practical way is the promise Jesus gives in John chapter 10. When he says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Fulfillment, fulfillment in God is one of the most difficult things to practically grasp. And I, we know that because the primary reason any of us go to sin is because you're not fulfilled with God. That's why we do that. The satisfaction of your deepest longings. Think about Psalm 34, 37, I can't remember which one it is. When it says, delight yourself, I think it's 37. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. What's ironic about that passage is when you delight yourself in God, what you want changes to become like God. It's It's not a manipulative tactic with God. It's a personally transformative thing that we go through. That hunger we feel for fulfillment easily. For the weak of character... Or just for the weak, or for the lonely, or for the disturbed, easily leads us down the easier road, which is sin. Sin is the easier solution to your craving and to your hunger. It's the easier medication than the good stuff. Easier to slap a band-aid and hope it goes away than to get the heart surgery. 
which is what God can provide and what we really need. Our thirst enslaves us. That's the language of the Bible. It's language of who are we a slave to? Righteousness or sin? Because either we are voluntarily giving ourselves over as slaves to God who is good and righteous and just, or we're succumbing to our sin and being mastered by it, which turns us into animals. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 9, A man is a slave to whatever has mastered him. What is your master? You are a slave to that thing. Genesis 4, maybe my favorite passage on sin in the Bible. God is talking to Cain, and Cain is frustrated. He's jealous, he's envious, he's angry, because his brother Abel's sacrifice was a more appropriate sacrifice. And God says, why are you angry? If you do what is right, won't you be accepted? And then he says, but if you don't do what is right, sin is crouching at your door like an animal. It wants you, but you must master it. Of course, Cain famously does not master it. He is mastered by it, even after having some form of direct conversation with God. If you ever feel like it's hard to connect with God or listen to him, hopefully that helps you. Like, we have a lot of record of people speaking directly to Jesus or God and not changing. That's encouraging and horribly discouraging. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're like, no, sir, surely not. Yeah, it's not enough. You have to make the choice. Yeah. What's interesting about sin is that in James 1, the, James talks about sort of the progression of sin, right? Like, its desire is conceived from your own heart, and at full grown, it gives birth to death. And what's interesting is that sin, all sin starts small, right, comparatively. And, and left unchecked leads to the greatest atrocities in humankind. It's just generational compounded sin is why you have genocide and sex trafficking, right? Or, or, or history of racism and slavery. All those things are just compounded sin. And, and you know, when you think about uh, ch child soldiers. Have you heard this idea where people are, kids are kidnapped when they're young and they're turned into soldiers to fight wars? You can almost think about that and like sex trafficking are like the, the most horrific evils I can conceive. And yet, these are all, at one point, these were all children. These were people. How do they get there? It's compounded sin. Just turns us into animals. Beast. You think about when you lose control in your anger. You just become an animal. Yeah. You say things that is just instinctive. What are an animals are instinctive. Yeah. They just do what they want in the moment. There's no reason. Like if a lion's hungry, he's not going to be like, I'll eat later. It's like, I'm going to eat right now. Right? Yeah. We can be that way when, when we want to sin. Right. And we're not controlled by God. We just get what we want and we do it. And it, it just it, it grows and compounds. It's the way sin is. Look at Romans 6. Just as you used to offer the parts of your body in slavery to impurity and ever-increasing weakness, compounding wickedness, so now offer them slavery to righteousness leading to holiness. You know, one of the reasons we run to sin is because we want to escape what we're going through. Right. Have any of you guys seen this movie? The Secret Life of Walter Mitty? Yeah. My top ten movies are all exactly what you think they are, except this one. Like, if I were to give you... I would say, I'll give you $100 if you guess five of my top ten. They're all like... Yeah, okay. Don't act like you know me. <laughs> Lord of the Rings, Gladiator, The Patriot, and then The Secret Life of Walter Mitty. It's like so random, but it's in there. I love it. The reason I love this movie is because I think it tells a story about my life, in a sense. Walter Mitty had a pretty boring life. He worked at Time Magazine, which sounds glamorous until you figure out he works in like the dark back room developing film. He's been doing it for like 30 years. Barely anyone knows him. He wears the same thing every day. And he, he, he loves this woman that he's never talked to. It's like me in middle school exactly. <laughs> so he loves this woman. He doesn't have the courage to talk to her. His life is boring. He's got a good family, but you know. So what does Walter mean? He fantasizes about being someone he's not. And he'll go through these periods where he'll just like zone out and he'll just start fantasizing about being this ice climber and that's the girl he's in love with, you know, and, and about having superpowers and 
I, I used to do this kind of, it wasn't, I wouldn't just like, you know, zone out like narcoleptic, but, but he would do that and people would be like, are you there? And he was escaping his life because he didn't like it into this other life, right? What's interesting about the movie, it's been out long enough, so semi-spoiler, don't be mad. You, you did it to yourself, right? Um, he starts to actually take risks. And he starts to actually do these things. And you start to wonder as the audience, is he fantasizing now or is this happening? You're not sure because he's doing things he had only fantasized. He's really living. And he realizes at the end, oh, someone said, you don't really do that anymore. And he's like, oh, you're, I guess I don't need it anymore. Because I'm actually living. There are a lot of connections between what he went through and what we go through with sin. There's a word, it's called escapism. The tendency to seek distraction and relief from unpleasant realities, especially by seeking entertainment or engaging in fantasy. Escapism. Discomfort, pain, loneliness, confusion, these can all be medicated in a variety of ways. And we're creative in our medication. When living in the moment is too hard, we escape. There are many avenues of escape. Your phone may be the most primary because it's always with you. Social media, obviously, you guys have heard it all, right? Of course, yeah. Okay, social media, like, yeah. It, it is, though. It's an avenue of escape. Gaming, one I was addicted to as a younger man. Uh, relationships, we escape into relationships. Uh, books, for those of you that aren't radios, you're like, that's not a problem with me. <laughs> Time permitting, as long as I don't go too long, I'll share with you about what I've went through with my escapism in my life. Uh, movies, TV, alcohol, marijuana, painkillers, and maybe the most destructive escapist mentality is that of pornography, which is destroying our world. And I'm gonna, we're going to look at pornography not because it's like the thing that you do. In, well, actually, a lot of churches don't talk about pornography. The reason we're going to look at it is because it's, it's, in my opinion, the best and most destructive example that serves instructive for us with these other things. Like, it's not that unlike the other things we go to, but maybe it's the one that we can all agree is maybe the most horrific of the avenues. Here is a quote from an article that I have on my uh, computer from, from my study of pornography. Pornography becomes a salve, which is just a medication, right? to escape that is used to tend wounds. Whether emotional, physical, sexual, or spiritual. Did you have a bad day? Medicate it with porn and masturbation. And the brain will get the spritz of neurochemicals that will provide temporary relief. Feeling the pains of youth or your past? Run to the refuge of porn. Soon porn and masturbation are just a part of life or even what gives life meaning. If you've never done it, there's a lot of fascinating research out now about what porn, not just does to our society, and not just by Christians, by the way. One of my favorite uh, websites is Fight the New Drug. It's a non-religious website that talks about how porn is destroying our society. And, uh, and it's not written from any Christian perspective. It's just, this is just the facts, right? You know, there's a lot of interesting research about what happens to your brain when you use pornography. I want to talk about it a little bit. I don't have a lot of time. Because it actually is not just something that pornography does. It's something that happens when you run to your escapes. Because your escapes are giving you neurochemicals that are firing in your brain, that are making your brain think, I like this. This is making me forget about my troubles. And your brain's like, we should keep doing it then. So, this is what sexuality is supposed to look like in your brain. God has intended that sexuality exists within marriage in a healthy way. It's a good thing. It's a beautiful thing. And our over-sexualized world makes Christianity think sex is bad. Sexuality is good. There's something we learn about God through it. And we're not talking a lot about that now. But it only exists on this little country road. There's one avenue God ordained for this to happen. It's within marriage. And it's a good thing. Arousal is just a word for when when you're awakened. It's not, we made it sexual. It's not just sexual. It's when you kind of wake up. And so sexual arousal is supposed to happen in one way down that country road. And it's only going to, it should only have one, one on-ramp, one off-ramp. But porn has done this to our brains. Here's what happens with your brain 
is when you do an activity more and more, the brain will create neural pathways that make an activity easier to think about. So your brain is like, okay, we like this thing. It helps us. I'm going to create more on-ramps. So the country road widens to a two-lane highway. The more you do it, more on-ramps come on, and your brain's like, I need to do construction because there are a lot of cars on this road. So it widens, and it's like, what? I don't want to have to drive 30 minutes to get on, so I'm going to put an on-ramp right here and right here, and so pretty soon, it's a super highway of sexual thoughts, which is why, if you use porn a lot and you're addicted, everything becomes sexualized. Even inanimate objects. Clothing. Walking. Being alone becomes sexual. You know, you get to the point in pornography where you're just alone in the house and you feel overwhelmed with temptation. There's a reason it feels like you can't stop. It's because you're teaching your brain that this is the most important thing in life. It's why 80 to 90 percent of marriages cite pornography as one of the two main reasons for the divorce. Did you know the average age of people saying porn is now eight? Some of you were like, yep. It's getting younger and younger. Probably most people in this room, it wasn't quite that young. It's just getting younger and younger. So many reasons for that they wouldn't have time for. The more you act on your impulse, the more you give in, the more on-ramps you create, and you make a sexual superhighway. And then that vicious cycle ensues. If you can't read this, I'm sorry for that. What is the cycle? Here it is. You're feeling lonely, sad, whatever. The cycle begins... You view porn to feel better. Or substitute whatever you do. The cycle exists in a lot of spaces. You act out. You act on the impulse. You do it. You keep it a secret because it's shameful. You feel shame and then you want to medicate your shame. We're back at the top. This is just the way sin operates. This is Satan's plan. You get stuck. It is not just a cycle, it's more of a whirlpool, isn't it? Your life gets worse. It's destructive, it crushes your relationships, it kills even your view of it, it destroys you. So many paths to this way of thinking. You're training your brain's neurochemicals to fire when they're not supposed to be firing. The question is who is your master? What are you mastered by? Are your cravings for these things, whatever they are, under control, or are you under their control? Escaping them will never satisfy your soul. It will only satisfy you temporarily, emotionally, and physically. But your soul will be darkened. You'll get in that vicious cycle. You know, there is such a thing as soul satisfaction, though. It's what God promises When your soul, your inmost being, your entire essence is satisfied with what God can provide. It's when you're not tricked into the lie that God cannot satisfy you. And that's the lie, right? The the great lie is that I can be satisfied outside of God. That's the lie. And and sometimes we feel like we struggle to believe God can satisfy us because maybe we've never felt it before. What is your soul thirsty for? Do you thirst for God? You know, kind of last 10 minutes as we close, I want to look at two primary ways we can grow in our thirst for God. It's hard, right? Like, a lot of us, I was just talking to somebody today, a lot of us feel like, I felt this way, we want to thirst for God, but we just aren't thirsty for God. It's kind of like, who among you just, you love water? You're just like, I love water. A, a, a very a very small amount. How many of you, you don't like water? Like you don't think it tastes good, you don't get excited about it. So, so most of you are like agnostic about it, right? Like you're like, I mean, I need it to live, so I'll accept it in my life, right? But you don't crave water. You know what's interesting is you crave something to drink, though. What do you crave? Coffee, tea, soda, whatever. You know, Ruth's like tea, you know. Is that what you said? Oh, you did say water. I'm sorry for putting words in your mouth. Ruth loves water. (laughs) Whatever it is, you crave something. Why do you crave that thing? You don't like water. Water's not enough. You wish you liked water, though. No one in here, not one person, I don't care how agnostic you are about water, you wish you loved it. 
Who's like, no, I'm glad I don't love it. I don't need it. You know, you're like, that's dumb. Like, we all wish it, we all wish water tastes like the drink we really crave. But that's how we feel about broccoli or corn. We're like, oh yeah, like if broccoli tastes like ice cream, I'd be crushing it. Just doesn't, it's not how it goes. A lot of you feel that way in your relationship with God. You're like, I, I, I wish I loved him. I want to want him, but I just don't, and I don't know why. Let me tell you the two ways, one reason it's not happening for you, and one, two things you can do to change that, okay? How do we teach our soul? You have to train your soul to thirst for God. Two primary ways. One is understand your sinful nature, and then go to war with it. Understand it, and go to war with it. If you want to understand your sinful nature, you have to keep asking why. Why am I like this? Why am I like that? You keep digging down, you dig down, you dig down until you find the core. When you find it, you crucify it. That's what the Bible says. You, you crush it. And I, for me, uh, one of the things that I'm most tempted to do on day to day is actually escape into my novels. I love reading sci-fi. I love nonfiction. I love fantasy books. Like, you know, it's the books that you walk by. Those of you who don't like fantasy and you don't understand it, you walk by it and you're like, this is weird. I walk by it and I'm like, this is home. You know, like, I'm like, this is where I belong. Like, I love this stuff. Why do I love it? Because it sort of transports me somewhere else. A good book does. And, and there have been times in my life when I found myself so absorbed in a book or a TV show or a movie or whatever, more TV shows and books, that I actually start to ignore responsibilities in my life. I start to uh, neglect my family a little bit. Not to the point where, like, my daughter's justified in her thirst for water, you know? <laughs> she's not like, I've never, it's never happened in my life where she's like, I'm thirsty. I'm like, sorry, I'm reading. You know what I mean? Like, I've never said that before. But there have been times when my wife's been like, where did Kyle go? Mostly before I had kids or was married, it was really bad because I didn't have that accountability in the home. And so there would be times when I would, I would just not show up to things. And I would be gone. And then I would lie about it because I felt kind of dumb. Like, I was like, oh, I've been reading all day. Like, what? Like, what's wrong with you? You know? And what's interesting is that it sounds innocuous, doesn't it? Compared to, like, porn. Like, you're like, I was reading. It's not as different as you might think. Because I was using it as a medication. Why? Why was that happening? Well, I find now I'm most tempted to escape into a book when I feel overwhelmed with the ministry. Okay, but when do I feel overwhelmed? So let's ask why. Okay, the next layer for me. Part of the reason I feel overwhelmed is because at times I feel like I don't have the answers for people. And I feel like I'm expected to have them. Like I have to be an expert in everything, but, but, I'm, but I'm not. I'm like 34 and like, I don't have your answers. You know, like I try, but I feel like I need to. Why do I feel that way? Well, I get insecure if I don't have the answers. Why? Because there's lack of humility there. I want to be the one that saves that person from their junk. Like, I really want that. You know what I mean? Like, I really want people to be like, man, Kyle, when I got with Kyle, it was, it was a game changer. It just doesn't often happen. It's not how it works. But it's what I want. And so I'm afraid I'm not going to be there, right? So I get stressed that I won't say the right thing. Why does it matter to me to say the right thing? I really want the church to be a place that everybody can feel like it's home. No matter their personality, disposition, what they believe politically, I, I want people to feel like, man, I can be at home here. And I feel like a lot of that rests on my shoulders. Now, I don't think that's necessarily true. Some does. Why does that matter to me? Keep digging. I'm not there yet, right? Like, I'm not quite there yet. Sometimes I value other people's perception of my work more than God's perception of my work. Oh, maybe now we're somewhere. How many scriptures are there about loving praise from God more than men? There's a, there's a great uh, line about the Pharisees where it says, well, they didn't listen because what? They love praise from men more than God. That's what it says. And therein lies the part of my character that I have to go to war with. How much I care about how other people perceive me. It's interesting. When you build that up, that's why I escape. That's why I get overwhelmed. Because I don't have just a spirit of curiosity and adventure to learn about people. Like, I'm not, I'm not as okay as I need to be with being like, you know, I, I don't have the answer for you. It doesn't mean I won't try to figure it out. Maybe there's not one. Maybe we'll never know. I feel not okay with that. I have to, once I identify it, once you can focus on it, then you can go to war with it. And how... Do you do that? Very last thought. How do you go to war once you find it? You starve it. And then you pray through it. 
1 Peter 2, abstain from sexual desires that war against your soul, or any desire for that matter. You can train yourself to thirst for God by starving your thirst for other things. It's not unlike training your cravings. Anybody here like sugar? Can I get an amen? You know, can I get an amen? Hey, you know, it's like. And if you're like, I don't like sugar. Don't lie. You know what I mean? Like, like, at least don't lie to yourself. You know what I mean? You can lie to me, but don't lie. What? Come on. Like sugar. You know, sugar has a similar impact as far as the neurochemicals that looking at porn does. Does it mean that sugar is like porn? But the analogy can be made that you, we get addicted to sugar. Yeah. We don't talk as much about food addiction because it's a little bit more innocuous. Right. But sugar is addictive. Yeah. And if you've ever trained yourself away from sugar, the first three weeks are just brutal. Yeah. <laughs> Have any of you ever done the diet Whole30? Oh my if you haven't, just don't. Like... <laughs> Like, they, just there's so many other ways to find happiness and joy. Whole 30 is basically like no unnatural sugars. Like, no processed food, basically, right? Process is like the curse word of the nutritionist world, right? Process. And, and it's so, what you, when you do Whole 30, you realize I can't use anything in my pantry. Yeah. Like, I have to go and, and spend millions of dollars. <laughs> to buy the ingredients like they did in the olden days, and I have to make this ketchup, yeah. and it takes me like an hour, and it's terrible. Yeah. That's how you'll feel when you start Whole30, and, you, and, and you're going to be miserable. You know what happens by the end, though? If you do it, you actually crave sugar less. Because yeah. you teach your body, maybe I've, maybe I've deceived myself into thinking I like this more than I have to. Yeah. Foods like that. I used to be addicted to Dr. Pepper. 23 flavors perfectly combined for joy. You know, I've had to really train myself out of my love for soda. Soda destroys you. Like, and, if, and if you want to just live in your deceit, don't read an article about what sin does to your body because you're going to feel bad about yourself. You're going to think you're going to die like tomorrow. You know what I mean? You know, I've had to train myself out of that, but you know you can. And you know what they tell you, you know what a nutritionist will tell you? Or someone that's helping you through an addiction? You have to starve it. Yep. Which means you're going to be really hungry. Yep. You know what the difference is between people who overcome their addictions and their sinful nature and the people that don't? One of the main differences? Can you get through the hunger and get out on the other side? Or are you too weak of character and will and faith to get through the hunger? Some people, you're mad at God because you're the same. Don't be mad. Be mad at yourself. If you don't have the will to just be hungry and believe that God can satisfy you on the other end, the only way to justify your brokenness is to blame God. And so we do it. We say, well, why isn't God there? God's telling you, we just read like 10 scriptures on what you need to do. There is willpower involved in faith. But maybe more importantly is authentic prayer. I believe that when it comes to your craving, willpower is not enough. I don't think the Bible is a self-help book. I think that willpower is not enough. We must pray that God would teach our soul to thirst for him. That kind of prayer, you know it when you hear it. It's not like, God, help me to be better. You know your prayer can stink? Like, not all prayers are created equal. There's a really funny thing. Melvin and I uh, were on the Ninja Turtles team. And, uh, and Ninja Turtles, we were pumped, man. Yes. We had those sugar gliders, Mitch. Don't. And then they scored like 10 in the sixth inning. And I could just feel my dreams being crushed. I really more felt Brandon's dreams being crushed. And Melvin and I were joking at the beginning of our, our, uh, one, one of the games... It was, in fact, the game we lost to the Wolves by, like, 14. It was shameful. They crushed us. Walter was like, you don't need skill, baby. You need heart. And we were like, yeah. And then I walked away, and I was like, I actually don't. I'm not 100% sure. <laughs> like, if, like, that's going to work. 
And so uh, Walter wasn't wrong. Heart's more important. But I'm like, is it more? Is it more important? I'm like, you know, we 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 made like ten errors in the fifth. And Melvin and I would be like, it's not about skill, it's about heart, you know. And I'd be like, but is it though? Like about that? Like, you kind of need both, don't you? Like you need to practice and you need to do it. But then there's something else you need. And if you've ever played a sport competitively, you know it's not just about skill. You need to have the will. You need both. And I feel like when it comes to overcoming your sin, doing stuff is not enough. God must change you. I think repentance is not a human work. Like, I think it's a work of God. And I think that sometimes the way we pray, it stinks. Yeah. We're like, and then we're, we go and we're like, I don't even remember the last time I had a real prayer. And you're like, what are you doing? You really think you can stop doing that thing by doing the same thing you've always done and it's never worked? You've got to get on your knees. Yeah. And you've got to pray, God, I'm begging you. You have got to change what I'm thirsty for. You have to do something I can't do. I'll do my part. I will starve this sucker. And I'm going to get a whole bunch of people around me to keep me accountable to starve it. But you, you need to do your part too. If you read the Psalms, people talk to God like that. They're like, where are you? Not because God's like that. I think God wants us to talk to him like that. With that desperation, with that familiarity. What is your soul thirsty for? Is it God? Or is it sugar? It, it, is your mind the super highway to sin? You know you can get it back to the country road? Yes. Crush those on-ramps. Trim the highway. Get it back to where you need it to be. What is your soul thirsty for? We love you. Amen. Come on, worship team, coming up. Great lesson, Kyle. Thirsty. When Jesus met the, the Samaritan woman, he told her, whoever drinks of, this, of the water that I give him will never thirst again. And that thirst, we need to be laid onto a rock. Leave it to the rock. Me to the rock that is higher than I, higher than I, higher than I, higher than I, higher than I. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. You're my tower. Hear my cry, oh God. Hear my cry, oh God. I want you answer my prayer, answer my prayer, answer my prayer, answer my prayer. Hear my cry, oh God. Answer my prayer, you're my tower against trouble. Lead me to the rock, lead me to the rock, lead me to me. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I, higher than I, higher than I, higher than I. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I, you're my tower. I'll take refuge in. Oh, I'll take refuge in the shelter of your shelter of your way. Shelter of your wings, I'll take refuge in the shelter of your wings. You're my tower against all. Lead me to the rock, lead me to the rock, lead me to the lead me to the rock that is higher than I, higher than I, higher than I, higher than I. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Day 
You're my tower. Lead me to the rock. Lead me to the rock. Lead me to the rock. Lead me to the rock that is higher than higher than I. Higher than I. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Please keep the kids from Kids Kingdom. Have a great Sunday.